Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, our first uh, spring meetup for Our Ladies East Lansing. We are excited that we have a lot of you here, and I think we are steadily admitting a few more. I think it's because it's such an exciting topic that we have all been looking forward to. Um, Our Ladies East Lansing is one of the chapters of Our Ladies Global. Our primary mission is to promote gender diversity in the R programming and data science community. And today, our meetup is going to be on accessible data visualization. And uh, Kayla, please, uh, could you introduce our speakers for the day? Uh, yep. So our first speaker today is going to be Kiki Wu. Uh, Kiki is a filmmaker, a storyteller, a designer, a developer, and a researcher. She's very talented. Uh, she has degrees in digital media technology and Japanese language and literature, a master of fine arts in film and television production, and is now currently working on her PhD in creative technology and design at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, her research focuses on visualization and accessibility through the, through the lens of multimedia design and storytelling. Um, so she's going to talk to us about her research today, uh, understanding data accessibility for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, and how we can uh, make our data visualizations more uh, accessible to that community. Um, our second speaker, which I can reintroduce quickly when we do her, but our second speaker um, is Andrea Gomez Vargas. Um, she is one of the winners of the Most Accessible Presentation Awards at USAR 2021. Um, her and her teammates gave an excellent presentation in both Spanish and English at USAR last year. Um, she studies sociology at the University of Buenos Aires and is currently a sociologist, teacher, and researcher with a focus on gender studies and human rights. She is also a co organizer of Our Ladies Buenos Aires. Um, and part of Latin R, so also an R ladies lover. Um, so uh, with that, I'll let Kiki share her screen first and start talking. And uh, thanks again to both of our speakers that we're very excited to have with us today. Um, oh, before, sorry, Kiki, um, I would like to request that um, all our audience be respectful of our speakers and others who are attending the meeting, not just because it's an accessible data viz meetup, but in general, we want to be mindful of everyone who's participating in the space today. So please um, be wary of what kind of comments you're posting. And we want this to be as useful and as helpful to everyone as possible. Thank you again. Kiki, please go on. Sounds great. Uh, hi, our ladies and uh, our gentlemen. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And I am Kiki Wu. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about our work, Understanding Data Accessibility for People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, or put simply, people with IDD. So when talk about accessibility, we usually associate it with disability. And by the type of disability and the particular barriers it presents to people, we can further categorize accessibility into four categories, visual accessibility, auditory accessibility, motor accessibility, and cognitive accessibility. Well, it might be obvious that visual accessibility is the most pressing challenge facing a disabled visualization analyst, and it is indeed the most popular topic in data visualization accessibility research. I'm here today, however, to talk to you about the cognitive accessibility issues caused by conventional data visualizations and the, the, their impact on people with cognitive access or cognitive disabilities who actually represent the largest population in a disabled family. So let's first take a quick look at the definition of data visualization. Data visualization is a graphical representation of information and data. By using visual elements like charts, graphs, and maps, data visualization tools provide an accessible way to see and understand trends are there anything in chat? Oh, sorry. Uh, see and understand trends, outliers, and patterns in data. So the TLDR is data visualization is first and foremost. Kiki, I think your slides aren't advancing. You're still on the cover slide. Oh, really? Interesting. OK, let me reshare. OK, how about now? Yes, I think you're on the correct slide now. OK, great. 
Yep. So the TLDR is data visualization is first and foremost a cognitive tool. It connects our vision to cognition to help us make sense of data. And second, using data visualization actually requires a good understanding of numeracy, graphicacy, and data and visualization literacy, which actually present a huge barrier to many non-expert audiences who don't necessarily have those expertise, especially for people with cognitive disabilities. And that is the exact, exact driving force behind my research, to visualize the invisible. And by invisible, I mean three things. First, data really is invisible unless you have a good way to make sense of it, such as using data visualizations. And second, people with IDD are invisible in that their cognitive disabilities are invisible and that um, this population has traditionally remained invisible, both in our society and in the field of data analytics. That is both really bad and sad. And uh, as a baby step to uh, overcome these things, overcome the situation and change things. In the past three years, I have been working on a study to understand how people with IDD interpret data differently and how they prefer different data visualizations and visual elements. So before diving into the study and their findings and the implications, just wanna give you a quick um, background information. There's about a ten, uh, 1 billion people in the world, and that's about 15% of the overall population live with some form of disability. And about one in six children in the United States has one or more developmental disability. An intellectual and developmental disability is broadly related to thought process, characterized by significant limitations in intellectual functioning and daily adaptive behavior. People with IDD struggle with abstract thinking, spatial reasoning, and have historically had a limited exposure to mathematical and statistical training at school. Data visualizations, which rely on these abilities to help people make sense of data, often do not work for this population. And our, best, our current best practices were developed without understanding their unique abilities. So as a result, people in this community have traditionally been excluded from data visualization and have limited access to data important to their well-being. That is really uh, problematic in that access to data is first and foremost a basic human right. It is a prerequisite for decision making and independent living. It is also the key to social participation and self-advocacy. And speaking of self-advocacy, our study was originally uh, inspired by an ongoing effort called the State of the States in Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. It was a study, it was, it was a longitudinal study which collected 20 years of um, IDD service spending data across the states in hopes of supporting their financial self-advocacy and decision-making. Back to the year 2018, uh, when my advisor and I first met the PI of that project, uh, the director of the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities, she mentioned over and over how existing data visualizations, such as uh, pie charts, on the slide didn't work for people with cognitive disabilities and expressed a strong need and desire for more accessible data representations. Uh, and in fact, in the past, they, they tried a bunch of different approaches. Um, for example, they tried a popular visual analytic tools such as Tableau or Power BI. However, the interface of this software was usually too complicated and just uh, not intuitive enough for an IDD self-advocate to navigate. Paper-based approaches, however, um, were easy, but when the data gets scaled, they didn't help that much either. So, um, inspired, um, so uh, inspired by that, um, not inspired. Uh, I mean, so uh, that, that that discussion and uh, that discussion and uh, um, the frustration led to our initial research question: How do people with intellectual and developmental disabilities interpret data differently, and how can we support their financial self-advocacy and decision-making through data visualization? 
So we conducted a literature review on multiple fields, such as data visualization, educational psychology, and mathematical studies. We also had informal interviews with domain experts, um, ed uh, educators, and the practitioners in a field. Drawing on these experiences, we identified three elements and made three hypotheses that might help uh, with the design of accessible data visualization. We hypothesized that the best chart type for a given task will differ between people with and without IDD. Traditional data visualization guidelines suggest we map data to chart type for best test performances. For example, bar charts are usually used to, to compare data across different categories. Line charts are considered strong in representing time series data, the change over time. And pie charts are usually uh, our default chart when it comes to illustrating the part to whole relationship in proportion data. However, we learned that people with IDD process information differently, and that the best chart type for a given task may differ than those recommended from traditional guidelines. So we, we picked the five common chart types, um, bar charts, line graphs, stack bars, pie charts, and tree map to see how they affect the data accessibility. And by the way, these four, these five chart types were also inspired by uh, what is now uh, what is now adopted by the State of States project in representing and disseminating their accessible materials. We also hypothesized that um, discrete data representations will lead to more accurate performance for people with IDD. So we anticipated that the discrete marks as in isotope visualization may benefit people's working memory and support their comprehension and recall. So um, there is an example of isotype visualization. So it is basically a method of representing quantities with a small number of repeated same size and countable pictograms. And you can see this strategy being used commonly in infographics. And this is also as suggested by a study conducted by Haraz Adel in 2015, uh, where they, prevent, they presented isotype visualizations to folks and they found that participants generally find it more memorable and intuitive with these isotype visualizations to extract information. So we tested the data continuity on common uh, visualizations to, to confirm our hypothesis. And lastly, we also, um, we also hypothesized that semantically meaningful chart embellishments will enhance data interpretation for people with IDD. So uh, we anticipated the benefit of using imagery to connect data to meaning. And in data visualization, there are two ways that you can add embellishment to a chart. First one is using icons, like in an example here, when we use concrete fruit icons like blueberries, bananas, and oranges to replace your originally abstract bars here, you don't even need a label to know what the data is about. And another way is using chart junk. Um, so chart junk, as, uh, as shown on the slide here, this running, uh, this running athlete and this little colored cars here don't do much actually with the data per se, but they simply add a sense of novelty to your presentation and contribute to the overall communication of your visualization. So in our case, in the context of budgetary data analysis and uh, um, self-decision-making, we tested the icons and the chart junk, such as the dollar signs here and the money stack as a chart junk, and also on um, this little people figure here to represent the scenario and the semantics of the data set. And for the recruitment, um, we designed both a uh, visually appealing flyer, and you might already notice it, it's my virtual background, and also an accessible version of the flyer as suggested by our uh, expert collaborator, which basically explained our study in plain language. And uh, in light of the COVID-19 challenge, we also made a PDF tutorial to teach our participants how to join a Zoom meeting. 
And in the Zoom meeting, we will send a link to our web-based experiment to the participants and uh, let them share their screens with us so we can uh, watch them finish their study and uh, ask questions along the way. So this is the interface our participants had seen in the uh, uh, Zoom meeting. So we conducted this study with 34 participants, both with and without IDD, to, to see the difference, where the differences are. And uh, in our definition, we worked with 12 participants with IDD. Uh, they, they, as they self-identified either with an autism spectrum disorder or um, Down syndrome or unspecified uh, intellectual and developmental disability. And we, 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 we divided our session into both time series data and proportion data in a context, as Professor mentioned, financial self-advocacy and decision-making. For time series data, we might ask questions like, um, is the spending going up or down over time? And for proportion data, the question would be like, what percentage of the population have a certain disability? We measured both quantitative task performance, such as task completion time and accuracy, and also conducted uh, scaffolded interviews with both population to see what strategies they were using to make sense of data. And our interview was designed in a hierarchical way to avoid uh, um, overwhelming and uh, fatiguing our participants. For example, we will start with a question to, uh, for, uh, in terms of their preference on the certain chart type. Uh, we will ask questions like, which one would you like better to find the biggest number uh, given a pie chart and a line chart? And from there, we'll advance to the next level, asking about our preference in terms of the data continuity. Given a bar chart and the isotype bar chart, which one would you like better and why? And finally, we will go to the embellishment level and ask their preference in terms of uh, isotype bar chart, a chart junk bar chart, uh, and a uh, icon isotype bar chart. And this same goes for the proportion data part as well. So we summarized our findings as four design guidelines. The first one is avoid the pie charts. Um, so as much as we all love and are familiar with pie charts, they're not accessible. In fact, our participants as with IDD performed twice as bad with pie charts than they did with alternative chart types, such as uh, stack bars and tree maps. And second, use familiar metaphors. Um, our study found that people with IDD, they approach data and the world through a very concrete lens as described by our participants. A bar chart is like a staircase and tree maps are like colored papers. And third, manage visual complexity. Um, while adding embellishment may help bring back the context of data, we have to use embellishments in moderation. Otherwise, it would overwhelm the participants and lead to distraction. And this is extremely true for our autistic participants. Um, given this WAPO chart with a uh, people figure in the middle, uh, they mentioned this just hurt my eyes. And lastly, use discrete encodings for axis aligned representations. What that means is when your chart comes with an X and a Y axis, feel free to use discrete encodings. Uh, so replace your regular bar charts with an isotype bar chart and uh, use a scatter plot instead of a line chart. And the one thing to note here is make sure to use this grid encodings only for those axis aligned representations. Otherwise, as in the case of a pie chart here, it would lead the partici uh, participant to count the, count the dots to arrive at a more accurate answer. And now I'm going to uh, show you guys a demo built with the data sets from the State of the States project. Um, to better illustrate the, our guidelines. Um, so we built three case studies to illustrate these guidelines. The first one is US total fiscal effort from 1997 to 2017. On the left is an inaccessible line chart. 
uh, on the right is the accessible scatter plots. Uh, use discrete encodings for axis aligned representations. So basically, we found that stuck scatter plots actually made it easier for folks to identify the overall trend of change in data. While we don't have solid evidence why it is this way, my guess would be um, when you're reading, when you are reading a scatter plot, you have to mentally connect those dots, and it might be just um, because of that extra mental effort um, help you help help to boost your cognition and help you arrive at a better and a more accurate um, trend judgment. And the next example is manage visual complexity. Um, compared to this regular line chart, the second line charts with icon do and dollar sign icon in the middle of it actually uh, executed the process of finding the maximum value. Um, and also as mentioned by our participants, this kind of representation also looks visually interesting. So they are more willing to look at it. And the second case study is US total IDD spending from 1997 to 2017. So the, uh, the guideline here is use discrete encodings for axis aligned representations. So when we uh, use the icon uh, the isotype visual icon uh, isotype visualizations to replace the regular bar charts, it not just only improved the task performance, um, the accuracy, but also um, made our participants more confident in their answer. The next one is manage visual complexity and the use of familiar metaphors. The one on the left is an example of adding a chart junk um, on top of a regular bar chart. And the one on the left is using a, a stretch the icon, icon bars. So with this kind, with this type of representation, it not just signified the context, but also improved the, the performance. And the third case study is individual states fiscal efforts in 2017. So um, avoid the pie charts, but uh, use stack bar charts or tree maps. And um, uh, my guess for this is um, first, we humans are uh, naturally better at lens judgment than we are to um, judge the areas. And second, um, when you're looking at a pie chart, you're actually managing multiple things. You're comparing the area, you're comparing the percentage and also estimate the uh, the different angles. Whereas when you're looking at a stacked bar chart, you're really just only uh, you're really only just comparing the length of each segment. So this would be an interesting uh, research question, and I will leave that for future work. And lastly, uh, manage visual complexity. So as mentioned previously. Uh, when your chart doesn't have an X and a Y axis, they're not axis aligned, try avoid discrete, uh, discrete encodings like in this one, the waffle chart. As we found our participants tend to, tend to um, counting, count these dots and that actually slow down their overall data analysis. Okay, and come back to the presentation. Okay, so um, our study really only scratched the surface of accessible data visualization. And the one thing that is not written in the paper, but uh, uh, constantly coming up from our study is variation is the norm and people are naturally different. So while we don't have a single best solution um, that gave us the, the, the most accessible representation, but we can have many creative creative possibilities, creative uh, solutions. And the creativity is a continuum. It's a spectrum along which we design and develop novel solutions. So as I was reflecting on our design guidelines the other day, I also had some creative implications. For example, avoid the bar charts really highlights the need to discover better ways we represent the proportion data. And use familiar metaphors means we need to add context to the data. And to manage visual complexity is really saying we need to 
understand individual differences because something that is complicated to me may not be complicated to someone else. And lastly, use discrete encodings for access aligned representations actually highlights the possibility of repurposing some of the older charts for new use. Um, for example, as mentioned, we can use scatter plots to, rep to replace our regular line charts and a bar chart is actually equally as good as a line chart to represent the time series data. So um, moving on, our next research question is, how do people with intellectual and developmental disabilities encounter data and build visual representations? So in, in, inspired by the uh, model from the disability movement, nothing about us without us. We are now in the middle of uh, in the middle of uh, recruiting participants for assignment structured interview to understand how people in the community encounter data in the most authentic and organic way. And in particular, we're interested in research questions like, what does data mean to people with IDD? When and where do they experience data? And what do they do with data? And following that, we'll also have a participatory design workshop to encourage people in the community to um, to have fun with data. And we plan to model our um, workshop after the Dear Data project. So this is a project initiated by two artists, one based in UK, London, and one in uh, New York and US. Basically, they uh, build visual representations to, to represent their everyday activities and exchange this, um, this visualizations through postcards. So this has, been, uh, this has been a big inspiration for many people in the data visualization community, uh, including us. So uh, in our workshop, we're going to pair, pair, pair people up as data pals and based on common interests. And then we'll also make it more fun to encourage folks to enter a six week role playing game. So here is a tentative schedule of the workshop. Um, so the first and the second week will help folks work with categorical data um, to work with different project, uh, different objects. And the week three and the week four, they will be working with time series data. Um, and the week five and week six, they will be working with proportion data to represent the concept of community. And uh, at week zero and week seven, we'll also have short interviews, both as a way to kick things off and to wrap things up. So we will have four aliens um, uh, as a way to represent the different topics. They are food, game, artist, art, and the sports. And uh, based on this option, we will uh, both pair people up um, on common interests and also as a way for us to assign relevant data sets for them to work with. And here is a word cloud of some of the uh, example activities we will have for the workshop. Folks will be building a happy list, they will make a creative selfie and also go on a circle hunt. And in doing this, our goal is not just to encourage people to have fun with data, um, but also encourage creativity and self-expression through data visualization. And throughout my PhD, my goal is not just to make data accessible to people with cognitive accessibility uh, disabilities, but also to, in, um, to make it attractive to people with uh, varying cognitive abilities. So that concludes my presentation. And now I'm happy to take questions, comments, or feedback. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your talk, Kiki. That was awesome. <laughs> I learned a Thanks. lot. Um, and if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can type into the chat. Um, and I guess while we're waiting, because I'm the host, I can go ahead and get my question in first. <laughs> um, I was curious, was the variation, I mean, you mentioned that like the best is very variable and everybody is different. Of course, we know that's true, but I was curious mm -hmm. if there was a little bit less variation in the people who self-reported or self-identified, you know, um, as somebody with autism versus your um, uncategorized, I believe you called it. Uh, mm -hmm or other categories you might have studied? 
Yeah, good question. So because and we only have limited um, uh, number of participants, so in our limited uh, sample here, we found that people with autism they generally prefer more simplistic representations that like I mentioned. Too many dots are actually heard in their eyes. Whereas our people with um, Down syndrome, they generally prefer more concrete and more visual. So uh, this is a little variation here, um, as far as I know. Very cool. Um, I see Denise has her hand raised, or their hand raised. Yes. Um, so I was wondering about that variety that you were talking about. So was this a study done in like a particular country? And do you know if there are any regional differences? Would you know, a country like Australia be different from the US or even Latin America will be different? Or did you expect to find that? Um, yeah, so in our study, we worked with mainly with participants in the United States and just, yeah, that, that might be a, a concern, like that might be a, might cause a difference if we work with folks from other countries. So yeah, good question. I, I yeah. Um, and then there's a couple questions in the chat. So Ruth asks, uh, what recommendations do you have about color use for accessibility? Yeah, that's that really falls into the accessibility, the data visualize, uh, visual accessibility issues in data visualization. So, uh, for color, I think there are many um tools you can you find it uh, use a color a color uh, uh, color blindness simulator. So where you can input your color palette to see whether they are friendly for folks who have different types of uh, color blindness. Or you can just uh, start with um, a color palette generator. They can you just uh, uh, they will give you the uh, uh, blind uh, color blindness friendly palette in the first place. Uh, yes, there are definitely color blind. There are, I believe, as well. Um, Bethany asks, did you find any differences between people with IDD and those without, or do the four design principles generally apply to both groups? Yeah, as I mentioned, the avoid the pie chart, those and so first, those uh, uh, guidelines definitely apply to both populations. And just, just uh, like I mentioned, avoid the pie charts. Actually, our people without IDD, they also performed worse with pie chart than they did with other chart types. It's just the things that exacerbated with our disabled populations. Give a second, just in case anybody else has a question that they're working on typing. I have a question. Um, do you know of any good resources that you could recommend to folks who do data visualization, like probably a lot of folks here, for uh, resources basically for making those, for example, like stretched pictogram bar plots or um, <laughs> adding those things in or is that something you would just commonly do by hand in you know illustrator or something like that i see yeah that's a good question i think so far as i know um to make those kind of uh charts you can you can feel free to use excel there are some uh building feature you can do that and there's i, I build all the stimuli with uh d3.js that requires some um coding background for sure so uh yeah or and so that's all i know maybe uh, maybe in, in infographics, um, there are some tools called the. Uh, uh, I, I don't know much about those. Uh, but those those don't uh, that those don't take. They work with. They don't work with data so well because they're just kind of um, more like a, you mentioned, Illustrator or PS. So they, they don't work well with data. And I'll be looking for looking up some R packages to do that kind of stuff soon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe there is some packages for that, so. Um, and Rachel asks, have you worked with professionals in data fields with IDD in your research? Yeah, sure. So uh, we have we do have an expert collaborator. So uh, she is the uh, director of the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities. And uh, before we started this this thread of research, we went to AIDD 2019 when there wasn't uh, COVID. So you know when we were still able to travel there, we talked to folks in the community, talked to caregivers, and pitched our research to them to see would this work, would this be something helpful. So um, yes, we do. Kayla, I think your namesake also has a question. Kayla Connor has a question. Oh, skip that. Thank you for putting that out. 
<laughs> okay. Yes, Kayla asks, um, this is, oh, she's saying thank you and very important, interesting talk, which I agree. Um, but also, do you have recommendations for tools that are useful for making accessible figures? Um, I think now we're still like, a, oh yeah, accessible figures. So if you are talking about cognitive accessible figures, uh, I don't know there is much tools. That's just more like a guideline. You are you, you should be keeping in mind while you are making your visualization accessible. But if for general accessibility, I do know there is something called the chartability. So it's a set of heuristic developed by uh, Frank. Uh, and he uh, they send of something like a checklist sort of saying, while you're an audit, your visualization to make it more accessible. And I can type the name in the chat. Yeah, so uh, hope that helps. I think that's the link that I posted underneath. Yep, okay, cool. exactly. Okay, just making sure I didn't skip any other questions, which not. Okay. Many thanks from people thanking you for your presentation and uh, from as far away as Sweden too. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you so much, Kiki, for your talk. Um, now we will move on to Andrea who is giving her first presentation in English today, which is pretty sweet. And hopefully someday I will also hit that milestone of giving my first talk in my second language. Okay, I'm really nervous, but let's do this. Uh, <laughs> you can see the presentation. It's good. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrea. I'm a sociologist and an organizer of Our Ladies Buenos Aires chapter. On this occasion, I will tell you a little about our experience while preparing a talk for USAR 2021 and what accessibility practices we apply to our presentation, which uh, may be useful to you when preparing a presentation for using R. Uh, let me share with you the presentation you can see online. So this talk, this talk will cover five topics. First, I will discuss how accessibility initi initiative was born. Uh, second, I will talk about how we organize ourselves. And third, I will discuss how we start our journey towards accessibility and the questions we ask ourselves. Then I will show you some best practices that we apply to our work. And finally, I will share some useful resources that you can refer to when applying accessibility to your own work. So let's start. About uh, the art community. I, ch I choose this illustration by Alison Hart uh, for this session, section because it represents what uh, the art community and our ladies in particular mean to me. It shows how the work we did for USAR will have not been possible without the support of these communities, um, family and, and friends. And here I want to introduce you to the team of, of us uh, belong to four Our Ladies chapter based in different cities and countries across Latin America. Uh, including Mexico, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and Argentina. All our work is done virtually in a collaborative manner. And I think everything that was achieved would not have been possible without our team members. 
I want to emphasize that we all have different areas of training and knowledge of art. These uh, help to make it an integrate work with different perspectives and views of reality, as well as to consider the different applications of art in our work. And well, <laughs> what happened with our journey towards accessibility? So how, how did we create accessible presentations? How was our path to accessibility? In 2020, the Latin America Survive project began, uh, began to emerge. We were interested in knowing how widely art was used across, across our region where English is, is not the official, official language. We wanted data, we needed data to better understand Latin America art users. In August 2020, a group of about 18 people belonging to art communities in Latin America and start to develop a survey to know the people who use art in Latin America. This, the survey was uh, made up of 13 one questions and five main uh, topics. It was uh, interested in art, demographic information, level of education, relationship with the art user community, and the area in which they use art. The survey was conducted in three languages, Spanish, Portuguese, and English so uh, that people could answer in the language they felt most comfortable with. The survey was uh, disseminated through all available communication channels, Slack, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we have uh, resulting in more than 900 people completing the survey. So um, what were we going to do with all that information? In 2021, a group, this group of six art ladies who wanted to take up the challenge of analyzing and present day, present, presenting the fair to buy results get together. And that is how we arrived at USART 2021. Ooh. no, I got Okay, okay. So uh, we present our results in a talk uh, entitled Using Art in Latin America, the Great, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And we uh, presented our work in two languages, English and Spanish. Both in the slides you can see here with the, with the links and uh, in the video transcript. Our motivation of using both languages was to represent, uh, represent Latin America in the conference and to bring our friends about the participation of other non-English uh, speakers in the art community. Also, data visualization works is done in art. We uh, began to wonder what practices we could we could implement to make our work more accessible to other users. So we have questions. Are we inclusive enough? We uh, started to wonder whether what we did in R was enough to make our results available to as many people as possible. Where do we begin? Where, where to start if we never study accessibility? So the first, the first step was to ask ourselves what accessibility means to us and discuss our different points of view. And we uh, start to identify what, what does uh, accessibility mean? For, for us and for the world society. Uh, we also look for open source researches and with the information we have, we started finding people who could provide more uh, advice at were applying the best practices to our work. So I'm going to say, uh, like Kiki says, 
uh, in a few minutes that uh, oi, okay. accessibility it's a right uh, and here's the the message i want you to take home is that we should think of accessibility as a right and indispensable human right of the development of a dignified life for people with disabilities with any type of disabilities idd uh, mind of mayor every action we promote and carry out make us part of this guarantee of rights uh, for us, it uh, may represent a few more minutes of extra work or training, but for the person bene benefiting from these actions can mean having complete access to information they could not, uh, they couldn't have uh, access previously. It's a change for information. So, uh, what's the first thing to keep in mind? What I have to think first. So, uh, we have to be open. We have to be open to diversity in your audience and any accessibility issues. Basically, uh, be aware that some of your audience may not be able to or have difficulties with uh, distinguishing colors, reading text in a small font or with poor contrast uh, against its background, hearing, hearing you or understanding when you speak at a fast pace, uh, or uh, they have poor internet connection. We have to think a lot about this. And here I want to share some uh, simple practices that you can, uh, you can implement in your work in R, regardless of uh, what software of programming languages uh, you use, but we're going to see R because we are in R ladies. <laughs> so for presentations, some uh, good first steps that you can take towards accessibility include, uh, first, give priority to screen reader friendly formats. Uh, you can use uh, Air Markdown and Saringan. These formats in R you could use uh, to prepare your slides and this will allow people with visual disabilities to truly access all information include in your presentation throughout their uh, screen reader. Uh, second, avoid using PDF uh, format because most of the screen readers don't not work well with it. Often alternative text is lost in this format. So, so avoid using PDF. And use a readable font and font size. And not all fonts are made equal. Uh, fonts like Arial or any sans uh, serif typeface uh, are best to improve readability. Le le larger, larger font size is better for presentations. Try using font size uh, number 28 or larger, not, not 12, 15, <laughs> 28 or larger. And this is very important. And this is a good question that begins previously the presentation. Um, I mentioned it, alternative text in the previous slide. You may be wondering what exactly does that mean? Alternative text, also simple now as alt text. It's a writing description of any figures of pictures in the presentation that you are doing. Alt text is uh, becoming more streaming and it's now available in many social media platforms, websites, um, software used to prepare presentations, include R Markdown, Sardingan, 
PowerPoint, Google Sheets. Before adding the alt text to a figure, we should not only aim to include a description, a description of the image, but also how it's related to our presentation. Providing some context to, to the images is key, is key when preparing our text. It's always, it's always useful first mentioning the type of graph or images presented. What kind of information it's included in each of the axes in case of graphs? And where information is grouped according to a secondary category show in different colors. Another thing to consider for images, especially graphs presenting results, is the color palette we use. Some of you uh, asked what uh, palette color use, and in R we have some packages that could help for that. Uh, we have Beredis, Mate, Brever, Color, Blinder. You can use them. And um, wait a minute. Uh, that make great color blind friendly palettes easy to use in your plots. Uh, these images in this slide gives you an example of how a color palette looks like to people with different types of color blindness. The palette used is Beridis to this right, yes, uh, is Beridis that allows different colors to be easily identif identif identifiable across the color blindness spectrum. And even better, you can identify the different colors in gray scale. You can see the difference between uh, ggplot colors default and uh, ggplot and Beridis together. And if you see the presentation, uh, uh, show the alt text. You can read the alt text. It's not only uh, images of ggplot now. You say two ggplot panels comparing the flood, uh, default ggplot2 colors versus the ggplot result using Beredis color palette. Uh, palette. Each panel shows uh, three superpowers color finds, uh, histograms, the default scales use the color salmon, light green, and light blue, but BD scale use purple, aquamarine, and yellow which gives a better contrast. You can see the difference between this uh, use of ggplot only and ggplot and Beridis. You can use uh, the other packages, but it, it's a good example to see what is the difference to see this. And how can I implement these best practices in R? Well, um, here I want to briefly show you how you can add alternative text, uh, modify font size, and include speaker notes uh, using art. Uh, let's... Uh, this is the art markdown script that I use for this presentation. Uh, here you can see in the beginning, I'm use the our ladies our ladies template that already has accessible colors and fonts you can see that in the, the our ladies customs file css uh, you can andrea we're still looking at your how can i implement these best practices and i no se ve okay <laughs> wait a minute uh ay como es esto ay espera Ya, ya lo comparto, espera un momento. Ya lo comparto, ya lo comparto. Acá cómo se dice todo. Ahí, ahí se ve. You can see our arts. Ok. Uh, ok. Sorry, sorry. Here. <laughs> Here's the our Markdown script. Uh, that I use for the presentation. Uh, first, uh, 
the Our Lady template. You can see the font size and colors in the Our Lady's Customs CSS file. Here you can see a font size, font family, uh, which color to use. You can edit them and work with that. And in our markdown, in the chunks, for example, in the chunks are the alternative text. You can use this uh, configuration, figure out and explain that uh, images, then explain in the beginning by Alison Hartz and explain what, what it means in the presentation. Also, uh, speaker notes are these. All, all I can say is here, and you can you can write them for people who are used reader um, screen readers to have screen readers, and um, all this together is reflected in an optimal way optimal way in HTML format that you see online and you can see later. So we are going back to the presentation. So it's a it's a few examples that you can you can use. And uh -uh. And these uh, examples that I just uh, mentioned are some small actions that only require a few clicks and maybe develop a little more time and detail, but will make your presentation more inclusive and warranty access to information to more people. Finally, I want to share with you some of online resources to read more about accessibility and what new accessibility practices we can continue to apply, not only in art, in, in life we can use. And thank you so much, uh, all. And thank you so much, our ladies, it's Lansing for this invitation um, and for allowing, allowing us to share our experience. This presentation was also done as a group uh, here are the links where you can find the presentation and learn more about Our Ladies Global. Uh, and you are welcome to be part of the change. So thank you. Hey. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Congrats on getting through first English talk. I think that's super awesome. One of my goals is to learn Spanish this year. So I'm um, hoping to also do that like you. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask or post them in the chat. I will go ahead and read them. Um, I have a question immediately off the bat because I almost can't believe it's this easy and I'm, uh, can't believe I didn't know this, but, um, so adding alt text in our markdown, it's literally just an option in the chunk that's already there. There's nothing else you have to do. Just type that fig out for your option and type the alt text. Uh, yes, you can see. Um, uh, wait, I'm going to show you. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, our studio. Yes, yep. you. Uh, using Saringan. <laughs> in Saringan, in the slides, you add a chunk and write this fi figure, but, but reduce fig point alt equal. ¿Cómo se dice entre comillas? <laughs> si alguna vez puede ayudar. Quotation marks. Quotation marks. Uh, illustration by and explain the images. So I did uh, that in in our markdown and if you wait a minute um, 
go to the presentation. You can see the images. Don't stop. Okay. And here's the alt text. You can see, and you can grow to all you want. Okay, and then my next question is kind of related. Uh, it seems like I've heard don't use PDFs now a few times, and I'm just like, so when you export it as a PDF, does that alt text just disappear? It just won't go to PDF. Okay, and that's the mm. main okay issue with PDF. see it disappear and. Uh, Jocelyn, si estás ahí, uh, uh, um, one, one of the members of the group told me that um, change the order, the information, and you can read the discontinuous. Okay. Interesting. I think Janani also has a question. Oh, actually, I raised my hand just before you asked your question. It, it was going to be the main difference between uh, PDF and HTML. Um, so the alt text that um, Andrea showed us how to do using R Markdown is super helpful for those uh, also using screen readers. So it adds additional context for uh, those, uh, those of us who cannot actually visually comprehend a figure, but they can read the detailed description that goes with the figure. So it is especially helpful and I would encourage everyone to very strongly use the alt text uh, that Andrea showed us. It's a very, very cool feature, yeah. Yes. I think it was a comment, if I am right. Ah, okay, okay. And just to complement a little bit the answer, uh, the latest answer from Andrea. Yes, the PDF, when you try to, to read the file using a screen reader, uh, doesn't work well <laughs> with that kind of format. So it's very difficult to navigate through the file. Uh, you can, uh, in fact, do like a, a, a test on your computers. Uh, for example, you can activate the screen reader on a Mac or, or using a specialized soft softwares. Uh, so you can have like an idea or of how your presentation will be a read, reader uh, by a, and a screen reader. So in that way, you can try to imagine uh, if your presentation is uh, going to be understandable or not. And when you try to use these PDFs, uh, the, the text sections are not uh, well screened. And also the images just, just uh, are greeted or interpreted by the screen reader as image, but it doesn't explain you what is inside the image. So that's what uh, Andrea was meaning by uh, that the, the alt text is losing in this kind of form. Um, are there any tool, like, should I just Google screen reader tool tester online, or is there a favorite you can use to test your presentation? Uh, I usually use my uh, predetermined voice all over on the, on the Mac, but I, I guess there are a lot of options if you look on the internet. Probably Liz could have a better idea of which of the, the, the best softwares for screen readers. But uh, yeah, I, I usually use the voiceover that is installed in my computer. Okay. And yeah, Liz says Mac has a screen reader built in. And I personally use Mac, so great. I will be using that. But I guess for anybody uh, for Windows, Liz says NBDA is open source. So if you are a Windows, Windows user, that's something you can use to check your screen reader accessibility. All right, very cool. Oh, awesome. And Sylvia's added a link getting started with NVDA. So for any Windows user interested in using that. Okay, super cool. 
excited to start using that to test things. Yes, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> go, go. Yes, now that I know how easy alt text is in the markdown, man. Great. Okay, so. I was even reading, um, I was reading a thread about making your tweets more accessible that had a lot to do with adding alt text to your um, images, but it also mentioned that for people who use screen readers, it's like very annoying when you put like a million emojis in a row, for example, yes. in tweet, because it'll just read that over and over and over and over oh. and over and just take forever. And it was just, it, that was really interesting to me, just something that I never would have thought of. So I guess that's why it's so important to, uh, you know, engage in this kind of thing. So we can learn what other people, how other people are experiencing our content. Uh, but thanks so much for your talk. It's been super helpful. Thanks for adding that because I also did not realize and Liz said like Wordle, <laughs> the Wordle trend is, wow, interesting. That is a very interesting information. Black square, black square, yellow square, green square. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah, I have yes. how that comes across. Ah, and John and e posted some accessibility guidelines that they put together for a use mm -hmm. our conference. Um, John and e was part of the uh, organizing board for USAR and they put a lot of thought into making the conference more accessible. Um, and of course, lots of attendees like Andrea and her team did a great mm -hmm. job picking that up. Um, yes, uh, I'm gonna, I want to say that Yoselin is part of the group. Uh, yes. Or... Yes, and Sylvia is here. <laughs> Virginia was here earlier, or is still here? Yes, money accessible, oh. our ladies. Can I ask a question? Hi, this is, yeah, from, from far away in Europe. So um, thank you for the presentation. What I'm thinking is that RMD files transform into HTML, they are very, common and accepted within statisticians or our community overall. But I do have issue, like difficulties with sometimes convenient, like explaining the, how easy it is to work with HTML files to the clients instead of like sending them PDF files uh, because sometimes when you do send them whatever results and table and plots you want them to look at in HTML file, they usually ask you like, can you please send it in a PDF or something else? So how do you, like, what are your experience with that towards client that not that happy to see anything else than the PDF? It's anyone want to take a, I think it's a hard question to answer. So I think it's a hard question. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I could probably, actually Sylvia had posted this exact question or raised it as one of the issues uh, for our um, meetup repository. Um, for instance, uh, one of the things that you could do if you're using GitHub is there is a simple trick. I'm not saying this is the best way, but if you're already using GitHub to share data, and if you're already comfortable with sharing it with PDF, then one of the things, one of the options that GitHub has is you can enable something called GitHub pages, which basically means by default, whatever your organization name or the user name is, it creates a GitHub.io web page. For example, if mine is Janani Ravi, it would automatically create uh, secure jananiravi.github.io. And the reason I'm mentioning this is if you go to any of the repositories that contain your data, whether it's PDF or HTML, if you say enable GitHub pages, it's automatically going to create a link there, meaning it's going to make it jananiravi.github.io slash my repository name. And I can easily link to any HTML and it'll automatically render within my browser. Otherwise, I know it can be pretty painful to look at HTML files within GitHub. 
you might have to download and then reopen it within a browser, which is not always convenient, especially if you're sharing it with someone who's not familiar with using GitHub or opening HTML files. So this is a very quick trick that you can follow, especially if you're using GitHub. Yeah. And you oh, can see how you. it's done by looking at our current repository that I just posted. I uh, linked the PDF on the HTML for Andrea's and Kiki's presentation. So you could probably see how it's done. All I had to do is go to settings and say, enable GitHub pages. Hope this helps. Yeah. And Denise added, you can probably share with your clients the advantages of switching to HTML, which I think is also a good suggestion because until very recently, I personally had no idea that a PDF would, was not very good for screen readers and it wasn't going to work. Um, so I think a lot of people would just be confused because PDF is such the default. If I didn't know this information, I'd be a little bit confused that somebody was sending an HTML. Um, and sharing that information might just, you know, open their eyes that they are creating barriers for people without even knowing it. So um, that might also persuade a lot of people to just switch over to HTML. Well, if there are no more questions, I had a couple of points to add in addition to what we already had on our chat. We, are, we try to keep a Slack that's open for everyone who's part of Our Ladies East Lansing. Even if you're a fleeting member who attends only a couple of meetups, please feel free to join us. And we post all of our events on Meetup. So do join us on, on Meetup on Twitter as well. It was really wonderful listening to Kiki and Andrea open our uh, our ladies East Lansing this spring. Yes, thank you so much. I learned a lot from both of you. Thank you so much, all of you. We'll see you next week. Sorry, next month. <laughs> <laughs> next month. <laughs>